right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics of interest to uh, libraries and librarians and library staff. We broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, but if you are unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week and it is then posted to our website to watch later. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives. Both the live show and the archive recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, please do share with your um, friends, neighbors, family, colleagues, anyone you think that may be interested in um, any of the topics that we have on the show. We do um, quite a mixture of things here on Encompass Live. Um, book reviews, interviews, um, mini training sessions, demos, um, basically anything that may be of interest that is a library related topic. Libraries is really our only um, uh, focus, goal, whatever. <laughs> um, and we cover all types of libraries here as well. The Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for, for Andrew Matt from Nebraska, for libraries, all types of libraries across the state. So you'll find things for all sorts of libraries here. Um, academic, K-12 schools, public uh, correction facilities, museums, we run the canon here. Uh, we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on and do presentations about things, services, products, um, resources that we think may be of interest to libraries that we offer. Um, but we also bring in guest speakers sometimes from outside the commission. And that's what we have here, sort of. <laughs> um, for those of you who are aware, in Nebraska, we have four regional library systems. They cover each an area of the state geographically um, and do <coughs> excuse me, consulting and training um, with libraries in their respective areas. And also regularly on Encompass Live, we do book review shows where we have commission staff that come on and do talk, talks about books on either certain genres, certain types of books, um, things that we've done for our blogging of Friday Reads. Um, and a few years ago, we did one where we had our assistant directors do come in and talk about books that they liked. Um, or they think would be of interest to people. And it's been a few years, I think it was actually 2016 was the last one that you had looked through it, yeah. So I figured we would do. We also have new directors now as well, some new people on board that weren't around back then. So um, that's what we're gonna do this morning. They're gonna talk about the books they have, they are have interested in. Um, who we have with us today is Eric Jones, first here. He's the director of our Three Rivers Library System, which is the northeast corner of the state, basically. Uh, Denise Harders is Central Plains Library System, straight down the middle of the state pretty much. Um, Scott Childers is the Southeast Library System Director, Southeast Corner. And then at the very end, and also at the end of the state, which is, this is not on purpose, um, <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Carroll, who is our Interim Director right now at our Western Library System, which is like the western end of our state. And we're just going to go through and have them talk about some cool books that they want to share. And I believe, so we're just going to get right into it now. And I believe first up is Denise. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, most of my reading has gone through audiobooks. So my reviews today are all books that I've listened to. They certainly help pass the time as I drive through my system. And with this group of suspense novels, there were times I wanted to go around the block again. I kind of hated to stop uh -huh. when I when I got places. That's a sign of a good book. <laughs> but the first one I'm going to talk about is Sunburn by Laura Lippman, and it was read by Susan Bennett. And uh, since Laura Lippman's debut in 1997, she's won more than 20 awards for her fiction and has been nominated for more than 30 more. She's received critical acclaim for provocative, timely crime novel set in her hometown of Baltimore. This unabridged version lasts for nine hours. Polly and Adam meet in a small town restaurant. She a waitress, he the cook. They're both very complex with secrets that left me unsure who I should trust or who I should believe. Uh, Polly is on the run from her husband and a three-year-old daughter. What kind of mother leaves her young child? Um, Adam is a private investigator who was hired to find Polly. Neither knows the whole story about the other, and they intend to keep it that way. There are plenty of twists and turns with both main characters spending a lot of time wondering if they can trust each other while trying to resist the attraction they feel. 
Sunburn is an entertaining psychological suspense novel with an intriguing storyline that kept me listening. That's a good one. Sounds very fun and uh, frustrating. <laughs> In a good way. Yeah. I say. It, it, like I say, you just didn't know who to trust. Every time you'd think, oh, well, she must be a bad person, and then uh, something else no, would happen. It wasn't that. Yeah. Good reading. All right. Next up, Eric. Most of my reading, um, like uh, Denise's, is uh, done off of audiobooks as we go to other things and we drive a lot. Um, I my reading tendency is more of a historical and historical fiction. Um, I do a little other other readings, but this first book that I have is the Triumph of William McKinley and uh, why the election of 1896 still matters. Carl Rove is the author. Uh, we don't often think of Carl Rove, who is actually a makes most of his money as a political consultant. Uh, we don't think of him as particularly as an author, but he does have quite a, a list of books, fiction and nonfiction, to his name. This book is uh, is not a biography, but is a story of an election, the election of 1896. If uh, you remember the election or the time frame is right after uh, the reconstruction of the Civil War. And um, it is the time when the Republican Party takes back control of the United States government until uh, the 1930s with the Depression. Um, one of the reasons why I read these kinds of books is the, you know, it's often said that those who do not remember the past, remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And there are many as aspects of the election of 1896 that parallel the uh, 2016 election. It is a time of change. It is a time of reflection. It is also a time when there was a great deal of conflict in the country from a political standpoint. Uh, William McKinley was running against uh, Nebraska's William Jennings Bryant and his support of, um, of the farmers and uh, return to the old ways of doing things or the traditional ways of doing things. If you remember that, uh, that uh, the Bryant's, this is the time of Bryant's big speech of the cross of gold um, time frame. Rove is a very, very um, energetic writer. He's easy to read, but at the same time, he can keep uh, your interest in what's going on. Again, I found this is a very interesting time, and while it may not be a perfect match, it does have some parallels to the election that we've just been through. Yeah. Do you know exactly when was this published? This has a uh, 2016 publication, oh, and if okay. I remember right, it came out before the November election. Mm -hmm. So right around that time. Right. Yeah, so it made sense during the publish yeah. at that point. Awesome. All right. Next up. All right. My book is The Magic Thief. Um, as an elementary librarian for 20 years, there are some books that are just in my favorite collection. This is one of them. It was a uh, Golden Soar nominee several years ago, um, probably longer than I think it was. <laughs> anyway, Meet This is by Sarah Previous. It is the first of four in a series. She has written several other fiction books. Um, this is probably um, third grade and third to sixth grade level. Um, Meet Conware. He is a thief by trade and a thief is all that he thinks he will ever be. That is, until he steals a wizard's locust magicalix. It seemed like an ordinary rock, but it almost killed him. Nevery, the wizard, tells Khan that because the stone didn't kill him when he stole it, Khan interested Nevery. So chapter one ends with this comment. The thing is, I make a good thief, me and my quick hands, but I'll make an even better wizard's apprentice. Now in Khan's mind, he's going to be a wizard's apprentice, but in Nevery's mind, he's going to be a little slave. So that's the first conflict that they come. Um, the other two is there are a lot of wizards in their city, and there's a problem with the 
magic in the city that allows them to do magic and but they don't know what it is and they all have the right answer but it doesn't seem to be working and so um the other wizards look at khan as a gutter thief that's what he was that's what he'll always be and um two people are on khan's side Nevery and rowan who is the um, duchess's daughter to be a wizard's apprentice khan must find his own stone his locus magicalicus khan never does anything the easy way or with the shortcut and so his stone ends up to be part of the royal headgear a huge green stone that is <laughs> this is his and he knows it is so anyway, getting that mixed into the trouble, the magic of the city. So Khan seems to think he knows what's going on and getting someone to listen to him to fix it is a big part of the problem. You just get started in the story and it seems like it's over and then you're ready for the second one and then the third one and then the fourth one. So The Magic Thief by Sarah Creamy is an excellent book. So. More magic. More, more magic. <laughs> Actually, there's a lot of things that are similar to the magic theme. Uh, my first book is A Darker Shade of Magic by V.E. Schwab. And um, if you're familiar with Victoria Schwab, who publishes children's YA titles, V.E. Schwab is the pen name she uses for more adult fare. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first of the Shades of Magic series, uh, but it certainly doesn't read like it. It, it does have a very complete beginning, middle, and there are some good spots where you could pick up the, the story threads for the rest of the series. But it, if you want to just give this a shot, it certainly doesn't suffer from sequelitis. Uh, you can get a one and done, really good story with this. Um, speaking of story, the main character, one of the main characters, Kel, is the last of a, a, a race of magicians with this rare ability to travel between parallel dimensions. There are four um, dimensions, and all of that actually takes place around these parallel, parallel Londons around the 1840s. Mm -hmm. There's Red London, where there is magic, and it's well appreciated. There's gray, there's white, and then the place that's been sealed off from all the others, Black London. Mm -hmm. Each has their own names, each has their own settings, their own cultures. And so you explore these different Londons along with Kel. And Kel happens to accidentally bring a piece of rock <laughs> from one of those places and it gets him in a whole lot of trouble. Um, I don't want to give away a lot of the, the twists and turns. Uh, there is a bit of mystery, but this really reads more like an adventure. Um, you know, like what when you're watching Indiana Jones, you know Indiana's going to be okay. It's the thrill ride that you're reading this for. It's not the the super mystery. There is a touch of mystery, but it's really about the ride, the adventure that he and uh, another uh, point of view character you'll be introduced to, Delilah Bard. And I, I want you to discover that uh, plot thread on your own without uh, hints from me, mm -hmm. um, because that is part of the adventure, because there's different Londons, you're not, you have to kind of learn four worlds in one story. Mm -hmm. um, it, like I said, it's published under B.E. Schwab, which is where most of her adult fair is, but really this could be a young adult title too for some of the more uh, advanced readers. I really enjoyed it, um, and it was, it had magic, but it's not super heavy, you know, it's not Harry Potter tale. It, it's really focused on the limitations of those magic uh, systems. So that's that. Another series I'm going to have to start and pick up. <laughs> All right. Now, this one, The Wife Between Us by Greer Hendricks and Sarah Peckinen, read by Julia Whalen. It's another psychological suspense novel with enough twists to keep your head spinning. It is also a novel, a debut novel, first published novel by this writing team. And I like to listen to those a lot of times because sometimes it's easier than reading them, honestly, because those debut novels, you never know which way they're going to go. <laughs> but this one was a good one. 
Um, the the storyline is deceptively simple: husband, wife, mistress. But don't assume that you know what will happen. Meet Vanessa, the ex-wife with issues. She's jealous and obsessed with her replacement, Nellie. She's young and you know Nellie's young and pretty, just like her former self. And Vanessa is having a hard time dealing with reality. Richard is the handsome but controlling husband. But what are Richard's motives? Vanessa is determined to keep Richard's marriage from happening and nothing will stop her. Now, like I say, you don't want to give too much away because this one is full of twists, turns, and, and crazy stuff happening. But The Wife Between Us is a twisted and thrilling novel about relationships and marriage and friendship. But you need to go into it into reading it as blind as you can. But assume nothing. The less you know, the better your reading or listening experience will be. Food. <laughs> Food is something that inter interests us all. Uh, this this is a uh, this was published in uh, 2018, so it's a new book. Um, this is an interesting book in a number of ways. It's sort of a travel log. It's sort of a mystery, and it's sort of a history book. Uh, it's the story of a fellow by the name of of uh, David Fairchild. Um, he is from Kansas. He um, comes from a family of academics. His father was president at uh, Kansas State and moved on to Michigan State. He comes from a from a family of academians. Um, grandfather who was at uh, Bria College and Oberlin College. And so he has quite a family of academics, but, but his interest is in um, agriculture and in plants. It takes place, or at least it begins, in, uh, at the, just before the turn of the century. And uh, David uh, decides, or he wants to become, he wants to see the world. Um, he meets a number of people along the way. Uh, the book is, as I said, somewhat of a spy story. Uh, America, Americans before the eight, before the 1900s diet was mostly sort of a meat and potato, pretty bland sort of traditional meal. And it was his, his job working for the Department of Agriculture to look for other foods and to, to, although it wasn't necessarily the intent to diversify the offerings of farmers, but at that time, we still knew and understood the idea of crop rotation and being able to do those kinds of things. He has many adventures. He spends a great deal of time in Southeast Asia, in uh, Indonesia, what's today Indonesia. Um, it's David's ex, uh, exploits that brings us hops to the United States. And um, <laughs> Nebraska, Nebraska is now, I was down, um, down by Plasmith the other day and noticed that that is one of the uh, crops that the department or the uh, university is exploring about, in, about having in uh, Nebraska. Quino. Kino is a fruit that we all think about lately. It's been very much in the in the news, but actually he brought that to the United States and to uh, the American farmers in California as early as a hundred years ago. Uh, the problem is is that it's a high altitude uh, grain, and so it doesn't grow very well, or it's taken time to develop growing it in our country. Anyway, it's a very exciting story. It's an, again, an easy read. Um, there is a link to Nebraska. Uh, Fairchild is the nephew of uh, one of the founding faculty and one of the early uh, administrators for Dome College. And my other interest in this is that um, he is a fourth or fifth cousin, something like that, to my wife. <laughs> And so it was interesting to at least to read a little bit about, although 
it's interesting that my family, uh, or her family, I should say, really knew nothing about. Had no idea. <laughs> had no idea of the relationship until um, we moved to Nebraska and we found out quite by accident that her grandmother was born in Hastings. So anyway, um, if you're interested in food, if you're interested in history, if you're interested in where some of our foods come from, guacamole, for instance, comes from avocados, which he introduced to the California, pistachios he introduced to uh, the California environment. So anyway, it's an interesting read. Uh, to me, I found it an exciting read, and uh, it went very quickly. So it's a it's a nonfiction. So it's a biography, or is it kind of storyified a little? No, it, well, it's storyified. It's storyified. Daniel Stone um, is a food writer, as I remember, and uh, and uh, he kind of picked out a section or a time of, um, of Fairchild's life and looked at it between the time he began to work for the Department of Agriculture until oh, the time he retired. For instance, I don't know if you remember, you probably don't, but um, when the president of France came to Washington this last spring and um, he and Mr. Trump planted a tree in the in the in the White House grounds, but as soon as it was planted, it was removed right. and went into quarantine. And that was one of the one of the ideas or one of the things that they brought in order to try and prevent um, right. Any problem problems of coming yeah. into. And so all plants are brought in have to be quarantined. Mm -hmm. But it has to do it. So anyway, it's it's an interesting book, and uh, if you're interested in food and agriculture and farming, I'm sure a lot of people are. Yeah. All right, quilt makers gifts, quilt makers gift. This is um, kind of a nod to one of my new pastimes, which is quilting. Um, the first thing that drew me to this book is the colors. The illustrations are amazing. They're bright, they're uh, not muted at all, and it has to do with the story itself. It is written by Jeff, Jeff Brumble and illustrated by Gail DeMarkin. It is about a woman who um, lived life well, and then life kind of did something to her, and so what she does is she makes these quilts for those who are homeless, who have nothing, but they're not ordinary quilts. They are quilts that seem to come from the colors of the earth. They're vibrant. They're, um, they're just a work of art. We'll bring into the picture a king, and he's not just any king. He is a pampered, spoiled, egotistical, and very greedy king who has to have the best and the most beautiful of everything, and he expects it because he has always gotten it. So he has heard about this quilt maker, and so he sends someone to say, I want a quilt, and she said she won't give one to him. <laughs> and he goes, I am the king. <laughs> and so, like a spoiled child, he does things to try to make her give him a quilt, but she refuses. So he finally says, okay, what must I do to get a quilt? And she says, give away everything you have. All of my treasures, and there's a picture. And it's like a, a, a seek and find picture. There's so many things in this picture. And so he says, okay. And the first thing he gives away, he goes through everything and he gives away a marble. <laughs> That's the only thing he can give up. And all of his treasures is a marble. <laughs> but it takes him on his own journey. And so this is the story that quilt makers did. There we go. All right, well, my second book is The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemison. And as you can see in the, the slide there, uh, winner of the 2016 Hugo Award uh, for Best Novel. Plus, uh, this was a Nebula and Locust nomination, plus various other um, uh, nominations. And, and I don't want to say smaller awards, but you know, you've got the Hugo, Locust, and Nebula. So. Um, this is also the first book of a series, uh, the Broken Earth series, but again, it reads fairly complete. 
um, for you know beginning, middle, end. Things do kind of wrap up nicely at the end uh, as far as feeling you got the whole story. Definitely, if you like the world and, and those type of things, you can move on to the, the rest of it. But uh, you you can read this and not feel like, oh, now I have to read the second one because I didn't get a full story. You do get a nice full story arc in this one book. Uh, reviews I've read about this have been kind of polarizing, actually, because it uses a rather different style of writing. The point of view characters switch narrative type. You have second person narration, which is fairly rare, and then the traditional third person and, and, and so on. Some people could not get over that fact. Uh, and I, I would just say do it because it also brings another layer to the story that I, this is one of those that I went in blind and just I had this massive aha moment in the book and things fell together at that point and I don't want to spoil that experience because that's what this would be in this experience but this this book you gotta put a little work into it you know especially I know there's people who, who see a second person and go wow this is really written poorly it's like no that's a creative choice and it pays off but you got to put a little bit of effort into this one compared to the other one that I talked about earlier when I was adventure. This is, you're, you're getting it into it. There's a lot of descriptive. Um, there's three point of view characters. Um, again, like, like uh, we were talking about before, if I start going into too much of the plot, you're going to miss that really gratifying aha uh -huh moment. Um, but look, I will just say, um, this is what you'll have to invest some time in. You'll have to get past maybe a prejudice against second person narration, but I think it'd be worth it. And it was one of the more rewarding reads I, I had um, because of that, by putting a little bit of effort in and digging it out. So, Yeah, I think it's good to get that kind of information in some of these book talks of not necessarily what is the story about, but how is it to read? Yeah. Because that's a whole other thing you've got to think about. Sometimes when you're recommending a book to somebody, do you like when people talk in third person, first, whatever? Do you have a preference? I'm not even sure if I have a preference. I mean, I've read all over the place. And it, if the story was enough to get me involved, I'll just adjust to whatever the author chose, how they chose to present it, I guess is the way to yeah. I, I, I tend to call a book like this kind of cheap. <laughs> right? You know, it's not something you just take a big bite of, swallow, and that's it. You got to work at it a little bit, but man, you do the work and you are rewarded, by it, in my opinion. And there's more, he said, in the series as well. There is a series, but I, I really, even just the first book for me was great. I will read the rest of the series, but, mm -hmm. but I did feel like I got a complete story arc out of this first book. Okay. Mm -hmm. On um, to Nora Roberts. Nora Roberts, going to say, Shelter in Place is Nora Rob Roberts' most recent one, uh, read by January Lavoie. And this was not a stretch for me to listen to because I listen to pretty much every Nora Roberts novel I can get my hands on. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't hard to do this one. I just really like her books. I just do. Um, this story is timely because it's about a mass shooting. And I feel like that was kind of a, a topic where she could get some backlash because it is something that goes on and we really don't want to highlight it. But the she handled it in a, an interesting way. Um, when I, the, the opening of Shelter in Place is really shocking and it drew me in right away. And when I hear about a mass shooting, I automatically think about those that lost their lives and about their loved ones, because of course that's who we have to, to take care of first. And this story made me really consider what happens to the survivors and how their lives have been permanently changed. The story is divided into three parts. The first part is the shortest part it actually describes the mass shooting and how everybody at the Down East Mall reacts to the three active shooters. So that's, that's the short part. Then the second section is the longest section. It follows the lives of many of the survivors and their family members and the family members of, of those that were lost that day. 
um, it talks about the different reactions. Some can't get far enough away. Some are stuck and angry. Others use that day to find the purpose in their lives. Then the third part happens 13 years after July 22nd, 2005. And that was the day of that shooting. And this is the part that is most like a Nora Roberts novel. That's, um, it includes a romance that develops between two of the characters. However, it, in the story, someone doesn't like how it all went down and wants revenge on those who that individual feels like messed up their big plan for these mass, massive casualties. So the question is, can this murderer be stopped like the shooters at the Down East Mall? Now it takes you more than 15 hours to listen to this book, mm -hmm. but it's well worth every minute. Mm -hmm. Big investment, yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank Krista for this one. Oh. Um, some months ago, you had an interview on your Wednesday mm -hmm. with a lady from Kansas that did a story, did a book oh, yeah. on Carnegie. Mm -hmm. And in that, she mentioned, or there was a mention of Carnegie's maid. So thank you. We went <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Carnegie's maid is a historical fiction. The character of Andrew Carnegie and his family are obviously characters that we all know and have been around for a while. Um, the other character, the female character in this, is actually in a, a, a culmination or a conglomeration or a, a mixture of the author's family history. Um, it is the story of a young woman who comes to America, comes to in the, uh, at the time of the Civil War, and uh, through a series of mistakes, um, she gets a job in the Andrew Carnegie household. And that's where the title, she becomes Andrew Carnegie's maid. Actually, she is the, the maid for Andrew's mother. Um, she, becomes, she becomes very friendly with Andrew, and um, this, this story is a little bit like Downton Abbey meets, um, meets the Robber Barons. There was a show on the, on the History Channel about the, the kingpins of business in the 1890s, mm -hmm. and a little bit of a mixture where it meets uh, the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> so wow. so it's, quite a it's quite a passion. <laughs> but it is interesting, and it, it, again, um, in my interest with history, it is a fictionalized account of a of class between classes. The name comes from a low class family in Ireland who has come to America as a result of the famine, the potato famine. Uh, she is sent as a family representative uh, to the United States to earn a living and be able to send money back to the old country, back to the family. It is a history of the political times of Ireland because the father gets himself into a little trouble with the, with the landowner and uh, the family loses its, loses its property, loses its farm. Um, the young lady becomes very, as I said, becomes very friendly with Mr. Carnegie. Uh, Mrs. Carnegie, the mother, is not quite as... Uh, enthralled with this. Um, and as much as the Andrew and uh, the, the May attempt to keep things uh, sort of on the low down on the, on the QT, um, it becomes rather obvious that uh, the two have become interested. Um, the May becomes, uh, learns from Andrew in terms of business decisions. And that's one of the sad parts of the story because she does have family who work for the Carnegie steel mills and in the story it talks about the decisions that Andrew makes regarding various things and how it impacts the worker and how it impacts her family and then she begins to realize that perhaps things aren't as benevolent as she thinks they are. Well 
Uh, I won't complete the story at that point, but I will tell you that it is an interesting read. If you are interested in um, Hallmark kinds of books, if you are interested in uh, semi-historical things, uh, then this might be a book that you might be interested in. I found it very interesting, and frankly, it did reach out to areas that I had not. Romances are not one of my <laughs> are not one of my reading areas normally. It's nice to to, to expand your horizons. So yes. yes. Um, the session that Eric was talking about, I looked it up here to see. It was one we actually did just in May. Um, and it's on our archives called Big Time Library Support in Small Towns, which would think you would lead you to this kind of book, but it's because it was done by an author, um, Romlin Tillman, had a book where she researched um, Carnegie Libraries in Kansas. So that's where the whole connection is. And, she, and then he had as it, written a fiction novel based on her research of real libraries and um, uh, art centers and things like that in Kansas. So if you look at that, we have the recording and presentation slides on our archives. Next, yeah, farming. <laughs> the farmer. The farmer. <laughs> Sometimes I want to comfort, I, I love comfort food. One of my favorite comfort foods is homemade chicken and noodles. I, I, it just makes me feel good. Well, this book is not a food book per se, but it gives me that comfort. It's that book that gives me a warm feeling after I read it. The Farmer is written and illustrated by Mark Moody. I met him at a reading conference in Denver. He lives in Colorado. This is one of many that he has written. Again, one of those first things that drew me to the book are the colors. The colors are very vibrant in this um, book. It is about a farmer. Um, in a bib overalls, not that all farmers are in bib overalls, that isn't what I meant, but uh, my husband loves to wear those, so <laughs> it's they comfortable. Work. It is. Um, this farmer raises fruits and vegetables to sell at the market, and that's how he makes his living. He has a few um, animals that he keeps very close to him. He's very um, milk cow, a duck, a pig, and in every picture is a little mouse that you get to find because he's not always in the right place. Um, but as in our life, something that comes up that changes what or how we think life is going to handle us is the weather. And the first thing that comes along is a tornado and destroys his crop. And so in order to buy um, feed for the next year, he has to sell one of his favorite animals. And it's to a neighbor who isn't a nice neighbor. <laughs> and Very difficult. I mean, it is hard to see an animal, a beloved animal go and then, you know, anyway. So he gets through another year and then this same neighbor, his boys come and set fire to his uh, farm. Oh. And so he loses his crops again another year. And so he can't afford to have seed. And so he has to sell another one of his favorite animals to this same farmer, the neighbor. Well, I won't tell you what happens, but it's, it's, it's a story about perseverance. It's a story about caring. It's a story about, yeah, sometimes it's out of our control, but it's how we handle it and how we come back another time that makes us who we are. And so um, this story is that kind of comfort story for me. Now this one, I noticed when I was looking for the information, it says this is a wordless picture book. It is not wordless, no? Oh, okay, that was some of his other ones are. I think another yeah. one of his ah, okay, because I saw that mentioned yes. in relation to him and I wasn't sure he's got a lot of things. He yes, he does, yeah. Awesome, all right. And we have a Radiance. Radiance, Radiance by Catherine M. Uh, Valente. And, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, let me give you a little bit of advertising copy I found about this book. Radiance is a deco punk pulp sci-fi alt history space opera mystery set in Hollywood and the solar system. Wow, that's a lot. And how's that for big, big concept? Uh, so basically, take the technology of the jazz age, right? Movies are just coming out, radio is 
probably the primary mode of mass communication yet, and then freeze the technology to about that. But they still develop space flight and they still colonize the solar system. Okay, so okay. you're talking jazz age technology, jazz age attitudes towards Hollywood, you know, the superstars of that age, uh, you know, and the directors are really important. But then you also have these crazy sci fi concepts like space whales. <laughs> cool. Right? Okay, so. If I haven't blown your brain about, <laughs> about this book, it's also written non-linearly, and each chapter is like a different type of media. Like one will be transcripts from an interview with the main character's father. Uh, and then the main character, Severin, uh, she's a, a director, daughter of a famous director, but she does her own thing. She goes out to the solar system and finds these things. But the chapters are written like, Transcripts from from interviews from the director, uh, like you're watching a film clip of Severin record, or, you know, making the movie. Uh, the gossip columns of what Hollywood be saying about, you know, uh, Severin becoming a debutante in that system, in, in the Hollywood system of that age. Uh, a children's program showing why space whales are great, um, and, and in the book they're called Callow Whales. And so that that plays a part of it. And so you got this crazy concept, right? And then you throw in this crazy way of presenting it. And it's a fabulous way of crazy. <laughs> Just, it, 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 here's the thing. For me, it was that experience of going through all of that and just awesome idea after awesome idea after awesome idea. The plot, meh. <laughs> I'll be honest, the plot, I'm not reading it for the plot. I'm reading it for this experiment in writing and this experiment in ideas. And I, and this I entire world that they created. Yeah. This, so I would say universe, right? Universe world and coming up with all these ideas that yeah. Yeah. And so like they're on this this cruise ship out by, you know, in the deeper part of the solar system, and the radio broadcasts to them and say, Well, we'll talk to you in what is it, seven years. Because they're going into a dark space where the radio signal won't ever catch them. Wow. And so they'll they'll have a, a long time where that ship will be its own culture. And to, um, and there are ideas in here that are kind of set in passing like that. I was like, explore that. That could be a whole book on yeah, its own. Exactly. Like that, yeah. And so, like I said, said with the previous book, it's been polarized in the reviews because mm -hmm. it is so not like other sci-fi books um it really and i know i'm doing it a disservice because there's so many other ideas that could be talking about but you know i only have so much uh, time um catherine valente she's also wrote the girl who certainly navigated fairyland in a ship right. of her own making so some of you may be familiar with that work i i have not read that book but i doubt it's this kind of experimental uh, if it is, I might have to find it. So I have that one on my to to want, want to read this. Yeah, yeah. And, and so here's the thing: Severin goes missing, and so you're getting this non-linear description of Severin, why people think she's missing. There is a bit of a mystery, but again, that's not the point of, uh, of why I love this book. I loved it because it was just so different. That said. I would recommend reading this in big chunks so you don't lose track. Because yeah. of that method, this is not a read it a little bit, set it down, come back a week later, because it doesn't reflect directly back. It's got to be read in kind of big chunks where you really get, um, I think, that I, overwhelming picture. So is it, is it sort of steampunkish? Yeah, take the idea of steampunk, but freeze technology just a little bit later. Okay. Um, yeah, and there's, I mean, there's deco punk, which is what this has been described as. There's diesel punk, which like around World War One, to World War Two, that time frame. Uh, I've heard some people say Flintstones was a prototypical stone punk. Um, people love pigeonholing yeah. fiction into <laughs> punk things now. I'm waiting for punk punk. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> chipmunk punk. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, if you're looking to for a different experience out of your book 
this is one of those that gives it to you. Um, because it's not just, I'm going to feed you a story. It's, I'm, going to, I'm trying to feed you an experience. Uh, that's the way I, I'm getting it. Now, um, but yeah, I give it more than one chapter. <laughs> if you really want to give it a, a shot, because the style of that first chapter may not be the style of most of the rest of them. So. All right, thank you. Um, I, and that is our last book. So we're on our list today. Um, all of our you said three different titles. I just randomly said pick three. <laughs> um, anybody have any questions or comments about any of the books or anything you want to mention? Type in the questions section. Um, this is great. As as I think Scott mentioned before we started, I, looking at the list, get more things on my to want to read list that I don't have time for, but <laughs> I'll figure it out. Um, and I think it did a really good job. As I was looking through and putting together these slides, that there's a lot of good um, variety here with the, the children's and youth books and nonfiction, which I know some people have trouble getting into. I, I, it's not one of my best things. I've done things more like that, the food one that you have, where it's kind of story storified nonfiction. And I work better with reading those kind of things. Um, so uh, I think this is um, really great. And so we have the slides will be available afterwards with the archive with the recording. So if you're looking for these books and the titles and everything, um, you'll have access to those. And if Jenna doesn't have any questions, this is just the information about our uh, four uh, presenters this morning, our, our four directors that we have. So if you do have any questions, let us know. Um, anything else you guys want to share as a last word of wisdom? I've got a, I left my mouse up here. Do <laughs> you want to share what we're currently reading or? Sure, if you want to. You got a few minutes. Uh, is, there, is there something to read at the moment? Or did you read some of these right now? For Well, I just finished the Nora Roberts one. Okay. And I haven't started in that one. So you're between books. I am between <laughs> books. That's a crazy feeling. It's kind of odd. All right. So I think that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, as I said, the slides and the recording will be available. Um, probably tomorrow, and it'll be on our website, which I'm going to go to now, if I can get this Aha. Um, If you go to your uh, search engine of choice and just search for Encompass Live, which I did here earlier, so far it's the only thing called that on the internet. Okay, so you can find us very easily. Um, this is our main page with the upcoming shows, but right underneath there is our archives, and this is where they are listed here. Most recent one at the top of the list, so this is last week's about Ditching Dewey. Um, today's will be there at the top of the list, probably by tomorrow. Everyone who attended this morning or um, registered for today's show will be sent an email directly from me letting you know when it's available and ready. Um, we also post that out to our various social media and uh, mailing lists as well to let everyone know. Um, I'll also let you know while we're here on the archives. Uh, these archives are searchable. As you can see, you have a search um, option here where you can search the entire history of the show or just the most recent 12 months if you want something really new, um, more up-to-date information. And this is the entire history of the show. This is the, we are in right now, 2018 is the 10th year of Encompass Live. And we do have all, thank you. <laughs> We're still going strong. <laughs> I'm very happy about that. Um, we do have all of our archives here. So um, we are librarians, so that's what we do. We save and archive historical things. So I'm going to scroll down here, and you'll see um, this goes all the way back to the very beginning. And you can see the dates that are there and to the right. So um, as you're going through these archives and looking for things or running a search on the entire list, be aware that, and if I get this all the way to the bottom, close your eyes, you're going to be busy. This does go all the way back to 2009, our very first shows. So as you're going through this, realize if everything's dated, so you'll know, okay, I'm watching something from 2009, 2010 or 11, it might not be correct anymore. The information might be old. Um, that service or resource may no longer exist. You never know. So keep that in mind as you are watching um, any of these archives. But certain things are um, uh, eternal. So um, you'll definitely still find some good things out there. And we'll keep adding to this list um, as we go, um, just keeping all of our historical items on there. So um, that's where the archives will be. I uh, hope you join us next week when our topic is Excel for librarians. This is a very um, 
and to be a very useful session. Megan Boggs is at Stewart Memorial Library in Stewart, Nebraska, just down the road from us here. And she's going to come and talk about how you can use Excel in a variety of ways um, to help you do your work at your library. Lots of things that you can do with Excel. For some people, uh, for me, it can be intimidating. I use it for lots of things, but um, I'm not, there's so many things like doing formulas and having it do the work for you that kind of goes over my head a lot. <laughs> so hopefully Megan will help us learn a lot more about that next week. So please do sign up for that. Um, we have our other August shows listed here. Um, I also have ones that are, you know, I'm working on September ones, so don't panic. There will be more added. I'm going to link down some, um, some speakers and some uh, descriptions of the shows. So keep an eye on this and look at it um, for what our upcoming shows are. Uh, and Compass Live is also on Facebook. Um, so if you are a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. We post when shows are coming up. Here's a reminder to log in for today show um, right here in we, when Uh, when our archives are available, we post them here. So if you do like Facebook and use that to keep up on things, here's a recording from last week's show, give us a like on Facebook and you'll be notified there as well. Other than that, that wraps up for today's show. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you everybody for being here with us this morning, coming in from across the state, <laughs> yes. in central, western, uh, all over the place. And I hope we will see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.